What's up, guys? Welcome to another episode of Investor Creator. Brad Smotherman here. Appreciate you being with us today. And today, I want to introduce you to my friend, Henry Washington. So Henry is a full-time investor from the Northwest Arkansas market. And in this interview, we're going to be getting into how Henry has had this meteoric rise the past three years, Henry's favorite lead sources. We're going to talk about his favorite direct mail list. We're going to talk about his other favorite way to market that brings in lesser deals, but his fattest deals, his best deals. And what I really love about this episode is it really caused me to go back and remember that my biggest successes have always been right after those big problems have been solved. And so Henry goes through whenever he was first starting out, just like many of us have done, where he didn't really have much money, right? And he had these big problems that he had to solve to get to the success that he's now living. And what I would submit to you is that something that I found in my own life, and I'm sure that you're going to find this out as well, is that my biggest successes have always been after big problems have been solved. So what we have to do is shift our mind from really being afraid and not wanting to deal with the problems to really looking at the problems as an opportunity. And frankly, that's something that in my life I need a reminder of as well. So as Henry and I are having this conversation, it's something that I was reminded of, and I was really, really happy to be able to to really refocus on that, that if we have a problem, we really need to look at it as a blessing, because if we have a problem, then we can solve it, and there's success on the other side. If someone has a problem, a seller has a problem that we can solve, then there's success on the other side of that, which is a, a closed transaction. So hope you guys enjoy this interview. I really, really enjoyed talking to Henry, and I think you guys are going to enjoy this. So without further ado, here's Henry. My business has never been just built around only finding rentals or only finding flips or, you know, only finding multifamilies. For me, it's deals, deals, deals. That was my first lesson in entrepreneurship. You know, you get these obstacles that are in your way and start feeling so down. But entrepreneurs don't quit when those happen. You figure your way around them, right, over them, through them, whatever it may be. Bigger risk for me was if I do nothing, like I can't give my family the life they deserve. That is a way larger risk in my opinion than taking some action and trying to get us to where I feel like we should be. In order for you to buy a home at a discount, you're really buying a situation more than you're buying a home. The real estate world is changing. Opportunity is everywhere. It has never been so easy to connect, share, and bring people together. We're learning from others and finding the very best in ourselves. Challenging our beliefs, overcoming our fears, transforming ourselves so we can transform our business. This is Investor Creator. Henry, welcome to Investor Creator. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, great to to be with you today. So let's just kind of go into the background. So kind of tell us what you were doing before you got into the real estate world and how that transition began to happen. Yeah, absolutely. I spent most of my working career in IT in some form or fashion. So I was software development for a while, and then moved over to data analytics for the latter part of my corporate career. And um, it's always been a a good career. I learned a lot. And, um, you know, most of that career, I was single. And so I'm single with a good job, no financial education. So, you know, if I I got a check, I spent a check. And um, I got married pretty quick. So, I met my wife and then 365 days later, I got married. And so wow. kind of like life goals and things changed very quickly for me. I guess I didn't realize that that came with the package uh, right away. <laughs> and so we were, uh, my wife and I were having a conversation about like future house and, you know, kids. And I quickly realized that I couldn't afford any of that. <laughs> um, I just yeah. didn't have any savings. You know, I was living paycheck to paycheck as it was, even though I was making great money, I had built a lifestyle around spending that money. So I had to figure out a way 
to get more money so that I could you know, afford to give my wife and, and my future kids the, the life that I felt like they deserved. And so I woke up in a panic one night figuring out that I couldn't do this and uh, started Googling, you know, how to make extra money, how to make passive income, give me some good side hustles, right? And uh, kept seeing articles and, and videos and things around real estate and being a landlord. And um, it, I literally at three in the morning, just saw those videos and went, oh, I can do that. I'll just do that, right? And then felt fine and went back to sleep, you know? And I attribute that to my father because my father was a high school art teacher for his whole career, but he always had a business on the side. Like before I was born, he would grow plants. He's always had a green thumb. So he'd grow plants, pot the plants, take them to the swap meet and sell them at the swap meet. He owned an arcade when I was a kid. So this was back when, you know, you go to a place to play video games when they were mm-hmm. just in the living room. And so he owned an arcade, which was pretty good passive business. You don't need to be there. People just put coins in the machine. So, and then um, he also, for most of my youth, for about 10 years of my youth, he owned a barbecue restaurant. And so I kind of grew up basically in a barbecue restaurant. Like that's where I went after school and that's where I worked. That was my first job. So I've always had a seed planted knowing that like entrepreneurship is a thing you can also do. I just never thought that it was something that I could do or I would do. But once I started seeing things about real estate and, and having rental properties, like I just knew I could do it. Like I didn't know how I could do it. I just knew it was a possibility because I've seen my father have many businesses. So I was like, yeah, I'll just do that. And so the next day I talked to a friend who was a commercial real estate broker and said, I want to get into real estate. And she gave me a box of books. And the first book I was read was Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And then that got me super motivated. And so off I went, man. So what is it about that book? It seems like that book has started like more entrepreneurs than, than probably any other book. I mean, mm-hmm. what did that book do for you? Uh, mindset, mostly. That was the first book I read. The second book I read was The Richest Man in Babylon. Uh-huh. Uh, and so both of those books, light bulb went off for me as I saw the thought process of these wealthy people was like, I pay me first. And then after I pay me, I figure out how to pay everything else. And I'd never thought about my finances like that before. Mm -hmm. It was always pay everybody else first. And then if there's something left, maybe you could save and then you never get around to saving. And so it just kind of, the motivation, I told my wife after I read the book, I was like, look, if we just put 10% of our salaries to tithing, and then another 10% of our salaries to paying ourselves and saving money. And then we never do a real estate deal because I get cold feet, right? Then look at how much money we'll have accumulated, right? And that was motivation enough. And then once I started doing that and I started seeing the savings grow and I had bought a property and done a deal, like all of that combined was just super motivating to just keep going. Yeah, just you felt like you could do it at that point. You know, I've talked to a lot of people about the Rich Dad Poor Dad book, and it really seems like it's almost offensive to some people. And especially if someone goes like the high education route, it's like, you know, I have a friend that's a PhD and he's a professor. And, you know, we we talk about that and he's like, well, you know, that doesn't work for everyone. It's like, but the book shows that it's a difference in mentality. It's not a difference in intellect. And there's a big difference between the two. You don't have to be an above average smart person when it comes to intellect to make this stuff work. You just have to work the system. And so you got motivated with the book. You found clarity in the book. I really, I tell you, man, what I love about your story, it's like you found a solution quickly. You're like, hey, I can do that. The next Mm -hmm. day you're out implementing, trying to find this more solutions on, on how to implement a strategy. And so then you hit the ground rolling. So how long between the time that you decided to get into this business until that first deal came? Um, it was, let's see, it was probably about three to four months between okay. when I read the book and when I did the first, when, it, when I put the first deal under contract. I was moving quick right away. So I went from like zero to almost getting started within like 45 days. And then I had a conversation with another investor that kind of bummed me out and kind of got me doubting myself. And uh, so I kind of just laid off for about 
I don't know, 30, 45 days again. And then. So what happened with that? I mean, what, what did this guy say? Sure. So he's a local investor, businessman. He owns tons of businesses. He owns real estate in multiple states. And so I uh, went to sit down with him and, uh, and told him, this is what I'm working on. This is what I think I'm going to do. And he said, well, how much money do you have? And I was like, I mean, I don't, I don't have any money. I've got like $1,000 in savings. He was like, well, then why are you going to invest? And I was like, I want to change my financial outlook. And he said, look, it takes money to invest. If you don't have money, then you need to focus on getting money, saving money. Once you have savings, then you should focus on investing. And, um, you know, there's some truth to that. There absolutely is truth. You need money to make money, right? What he didn't tell me and what I wasn't thinking of at the time was it doesn't have to be your money, right? You can use other people's money to get started investing. And so, you know, I just kind of stopped and said, all right, well, I'll just focus on saving. You know, this guy knows what he's talking about. And then it took me a while to kind of understand that, like, I don't need to let somebody else dictate my path. That may have been his path right? And how he got to where he is. And that's great for him, but that doesn't have to be my path, right? And I can make my own way and I can figure out my own processes to get to where I want to go right now. And so just kind of had a heart to heart with my wife and she said, suck it up, let's let's just go do it. And so we flipped the switch again and and got going. Very cool. And one thing I, I think is important to point out, he probably wasn't trying to like derail you from your path. Yeah. Yeah, he was not. He absolutely. You know, he he was probably trying to give you what he felt was good advice, but it just wasn't good advice for you. You know, and so I think a lot of people, especially when they start, they have all these naysayers around them, and sometimes you're married to the person, which right. is really tough. You know, I didn't experience that, but I have friends of mine that have, mm-hmm. and you know, you're living with this person, and they're telling you, well, you probably shouldn't do that. You know, let's not risk and and all of these things, and and that's right. a tough, tough thing to deal with. But you know, at the end of the day, you got to live your own path. Yeah. So you and your wife had a heart to heart. Sounds like she was super supportive. From day one, man, she was, she's always had my back. She's always supported me. She's always trusted me. Even when, you know, I have a cockamamie idea at three in the morning and just decide I want to implement it. She was like, All right, <laughs> but, right. um, but it sounds like the end of the story works out pretty well. So, so far, so good. So yeah, far. Cool. Good. All right. So it, 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 it is comforting knowing that, you know, whether I, make a bajillion dollars and fall flat on my face and lose all our money. And she still got my back. Yeah. That's super awesome, man. That's a blessing for sure. So how did you come across the first deal? Telling people what I was doing. So I, um, I just decided, like I said, that I was going to do this. And so because I had made that decision, I just started telling people that I'm a real estate investor and I'm buying rental homes. I didn't have any money and I'd never bought a home, but that's energy I put out there because I just wanted You know, it's always been a, I've always been a kind of ready, fire, aim. And so uh, I just strongly believe that like you are who you want to be. And so I just told people I'm buying rental properties. If you know of anybody, let me know. And uh, a good buddy of mine was actually in a tough spot with with the house he owned. And when he heard that, he contacted me immediately. He heard it through some friends at work and he contacted me and said, Hey, I've I've got a house that I have to sell. And, um, I got a I got a guy living in it who's just paying the mortgage for me. I was doing him a favor. He was supposed to get his credit together to buy it. And my time is up. I have to sell it. He can't buy it. You know, can you buy it quickly? And he told me what price he wanted. And I was like, yeah, yeah, I can buy it. I had no money. I didn't know how I was going to buy it. But it's like, yeah, yeah, I can buy it. So um, after I ran the numbers, saw it was a good deal. I had to figure out the house. He was wanting 115000 The house was probably worth about 145 at the time. And so um, I had to figure out where I was going to come up with about 20 grand. And uh, man, I turned over every stone. I kicked every rock around and tried to find extra money. What could I sell? Who could I borrow from? And I just was coming up goose eggs. And so I was starting to, again, starting to feel discouraged. And I called a, a buddy of mine who is now my business partner. I called him. He's had some investments in the past. And I said, hey, man, uh, I know you're looking at rental properties. I think you're in a better financial position than I am right now. My buddy needs to sell this house. Can you buy it? You know, um, I just want to get him out of a tough situation. I can't buy it. And he said, well, yeah, I can buy it. He was like, but you need to buy it. And I was like, man, I've, I've tried. He was like, well, you need to figure it out. <laughs> right. And like, that was my first like 
lesson in, in entrepreneurship. It's that like, you know, you get these obstacles that are in your way and you start feeling so down, but entrepreneurs don't quit when those happen. You yeah. figure out a way around them, right? Over them, through them, whatever it may be. It was like, go figure it out. And I was like, oh, I, I don't know where to figure it out. And he was like, well, let's talk about it. And so we just started brainstorming ideas. And he was like, well, do you have a 401k? And I was like, no, but my wife does. And he was like, well, there you go. And I was like, what do you mean? He was like, well, you can borrow against your 401k. I had no clue that I could do that, right? So my wife looked into it. She ended up taking out the loan for 20 grand out of her 401k, and um, which turned out to be a pretty good thing because you pay yourself back in interest to yourself. It's your own money. So, mm -hmm. you know, uh, it was a good investment from our standpoint because we had an investment property paying that back. So we bought the property and um, immediately had some, some equity. We took the tenant that was in it, we left him in it, and we raised his rent to cover everything and make us a little bit of cash flow. So now we got a, an asset paying all the expenses, right? And then paying us a little bit as well. And, you know, to go from trying to figure out how to have a side hustle, how to make some extra income to like the reality of you now have a property, A, that has equity that you can leverage to buy other deals, right? So you bought yourself some net worth right? B, that's paying you every month and C, that provides you a, a tax shelter on the money that you make. Like it was just mind blowing to me. I was like, I have to do this again right now a lot. So you didn't retire after your first deal is what you're saying? <laughs> no, sir. No, sir. I wanted to rinse and repeat, man. All right. So how did you feel? So you go to closing, you sign the docs. Is it kind of surreal at that point? Like I have this rental house? It, you know, you know, looking back, it was terrifying up until the point I signed the papers. And then it was just like, whew, yeah, it, right. I did it. I know how it's going to get paid. Right. So I wasn't fearful of the note not getting paid. I also knew enough about the market that like if that guy decided to leave, that I have another renter in there so quick. So they're just I knew at the price point that I got it, that I couldn't lose. If he left. And I couldn't find another renter, then I know I could sell it for more than what I bought it for. Like, I just knew it was in a good position. So, you know, terrifying up until the point I signed the papers. And then once that first rent check came in, I was like, oh, man, this works. Right yeah, now. this is real. This yeah. is real. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we find the same thing happens. Most of what we do is owner finance. So, you know, one of the things that people don't like about notes is with a rental, you can go and touch sticks and bricks. With a note, you can go and touch your file cabinet. Right. You know, so it doesn't feel as real as a rental right? Until the cash flow starts coming in, you know, right. and so it's, it's kind of the same thing. So a, a couple of things I want to point on there. I mean, one of the things that I've found in my career is that it's almost always like the success is right past that big obstacle that you don't know the answer to. And like, I've seen this time and time again in my career, and it sounds like that was the exact same thing for you. And then also like, I have to give kudos to your friend now business partner that gave some tough love like no man like this is your deal you need to figure it out like yeah. I'm not going to come in here and buy it and take it away from you like that guy did you a real favor on that yeah, yeah, sure. it, it started everything yeah right on all right so you're also doing some flips so was the first couple of deals rentals or did you get into the flip side after the, the first rental you know the first deal in the first flip kind of happened almost simultaneously uh, again, because I was telling people what I was doing, I had a realtor who was part of the Real Estate Investor Association that I had joined yep. call me and said, hey, man, I've got a potential deal. It's a listing I've been trying to get to put on the market, but the lady is just embarrassed about the condition of her house, and she's been through a tough time. She, she got divorced and hasn't been able to keep up with the house, and all the kids moved back in. and." She just wants to sell it. She owns it free and clear. She just wants to sell it and move, but she really, really is embarrassed about having people come in and out of her home. And he said, I told her that, you know, I can have an investor, just one investor come in here and buy it. He was like, but you're not going to get the money that you would get if I listed it. And she said that that was fine. She just in a bad spot and, and just was truly embarrassed by her house. And so I said, sure, I'll go take a look. I didn't think it was going to be a deal. And I went and it was a gorgeous home, three or uh, four bed, three bath, like 
25, 36 square feet in a neighborhood in Fayetteville here that everybody wants to live in. And the price was great. It was 190 that she wanted. The ARV on the house at the time was like 300. Um, other houses in the neighborhood were going for that and more. And it didn't need much work. She was, she just had clutter, like the house was fine. And so uh, I walked it and I was like, it seems like a great deal. So I put it under contract and um, put it under contract. I spent about 40 to 50 grand in the rehab and um, sold it a few months later for 325. I mean, and it was, I sold it for sale by owner. Like I just stuck a sign in the yard before I had a realtor listed and I had, I had an offer in. And uh, so, so great deal as an investor, uh, misleading deal as your first deal as an investor, because my immediate thought was I can do this all day long, right? Just give me 10 more like that. I know right. I've never found another deal with that easy of a profit margin in the perfect neighborhood like it, it was just so many so many things going in the right direction in one deal uh, well it, it's a good one to start you off for yeah, sure yeah yeah so it uh it worked out well so between that flip plus the equity i had in that first rental it really gave me uh the capital that i needed to grow and move forward so at that point you had some cash you had some net worth you began to really build a business and That's so right. from my perspective, business really starts w- with what we do as equity buyers. It really starts with marketing. So it sounded like at the, the beginning, you were kind of doing sweat marketing, you were networking, that kind of thing. And that brought you what you needed to kind of the, to get the seed money to begin marketing. So tell us how you're finding deals now. I do direct mail marketing and I do lead generation website with a Google AdWords campaign that runs. And those are the two marketing channels I use. My direct mail marketing produces more leads. My website produces better value leads, if that makes sense. So it does. Yeah. yeah. Because I can touch more people with mail based on how many mailers I send, I get a good quantity of deals. The deals with the most room on them usually come from my website because, you know. With direct mail, you're reaching people. With your website, people are reaching you. So there's more motivation. Yeah, that that makes a lot of sense. So let's talk about direct mail first. I mean, number one, what kind of a mail piece are you doing? And then what kind of a list do you find to be the most effective? Because it seems like direct mail, you know, we used to do a lot of direct mail maybe five years ago. We were doing 50 to 70,000 pieces a month. And it got to where, you know, the call volume was there, but the deal flow wasn't as much because people, you know, were just getting mailed to death. So I think you've kind of come up with a, a really interesting way to get around that. Yeah. So what I do is, um, so when I started, I was trying to filter for, for a deal, you need equity, you need motivation, right? If, if you don't have those two things, then they can call a realtor. So what I was looking for was people who had equity in their home, who potentially had a reason to sell at a discount. And so that reason I was using age as a filter with the assumption that people over a certain age may have a distressed property because they can't keep up with it anymore, or maybe a spouse died and it's just been too much. And now they've got this distressed property that they can't, they can't fix up to sell retail. So I did that and it worked out well, but the reason I chose that was because when I was doing my research on, you know, who I should mail to for direct mail, who might be motivated. I just kept making lists of every podcast or or book or article that I read of like, who are people marketing to? And then I would look for the common denominators among those lists, which were usually absentee owners, right? And I said, great, these are the two or three people, motivated people that people are reaching out to. And I do not want to mail those people, right? And the reason being for that is because, like you said, I didn't want my mail to just be another piece of mail from somebody else that they threw in a stack. Like I wanted, you know, somebody fresh, right? Somebody who hadn't been mailed to before who might be in a tough spot. So I was just trying to think a little differently about who I could touch or how I could touch them and how I could, you know, as a new guy too, like, you know, 
I didn't want to be going up against somebody like you. Like I, I wanted to find, I wanted to go up against, uh, you know, an, another new guy, right? I just didn't have the negotiation skills or, you know, I didn't understand all those things. So I, I wanted to limit, you know, my competition as well. So finding a niche where there were less people mailing to, I felt like would benefit me. Yeah. So you went to the stream less fish, which makes a lot of sense. And so did you start with direct mail or did you start with Google ads? Correct. Did them both at the same time. Oh, you did them both at the same time. Okay, cool. All right. So in terms of, so it sounds like most of your lead flow and deal flow comes from direct mail, but your better deals are Google ads. Correct. So kind of walk us through, like, I guess some people probably don't even know how Google ads work. So if you can kind of go through like what Google ads is and and how it works and, and how it's a better medium in terms of motivation. Sure. Um, so the first thing I did when I first got started after my panic attack um, was, like I said, I decided I was going to be an investor. So I immediately went and started doing research on how to get myself a website because my immediate thought was if I can get a website up and I can start doing some digging on, on Craigslist or you know Facebook for properties, I can have a website to at least point people to. Uh, so I did that immediately. And so I had this website. And um, so what Google AdWords does is so, right, there's two ways for you to get your website ranked among the top, you know, search findings when you type something into Google, right? The one way is organically by just your website existing and being linked to other websites and just being something that people are frequently looking for. And that takes years sometimes, right? Mm -hmm. Just organically rank your website up. Other way is you can use a Google AdWords campaign. And what that is, is, so when you type something into Google, usually the first three or four search terms or search findings are something, the link has a little ad ad button next to it. Those are Google AdWords campaigns running on those websites, right? And so what they do is they allow you to put in certain Google search terms, certain words, that you think people would type in in order to find your website. And when those words come up, your website will pop up at the top if you are, if your campaign is running, right? And so you're paying for those clicks. That's what it's, it's called pay per click. So the more words and terms and things you have, the more expensive it can be, the more targeted or specific your terms are, the more expensive it can be, right? So if you have broad, just broad search terms, it'll be a little cheaper, but that means you might not get found as easy, right? And so you can build these campaigns around phrases and things. So we have phrases for like, you know, how do I sell my house quick in Northwest Arkansas or who buys houses for cash in Northwest Arkansas? Like phrases like that would trigger our website to pop up. You can pay for those clicks. So it can be costly, right? Because you basically set a monthly budget and your ad will run as long as your budget is not been met yet. Um, but once your budget is met, then your ad doesn't run anymore. So if you don't set the right budget to spend the proper amount of money, then your, your website doesn't stay visible to others. So it can be costly, but also very profitable. So in other words, if you mess up and you set it for a thousand a day instead of a thousand a month, you could have a real problem. You could burn that pretty quick. <laughs> yeah, so we don't want to do that. Yeah, and I mean, honestly, I mean, we've been running PPC almost predominantly for three, three and a half years, maybe. And there's a big difference, guys, in someone searching you out actively because they've realized that they have a problem versus being contacted uh, in their mailbox because they think that someone wrote a handwritten letter that is specifically to them. And they've, this, this buyer's fallen in love with my house and they're going to give me tip top market value, you know, like anything works some of the time, but in terms of efficiency, I mean, I'm sure you would agree that, you know, a hundred PPC leads are worth far more than a hundred phone calls from yellow letters. So. Yes, sir. Cool. All right. So tell us what does your business look like now? So we kind of went through how you started, you began to scale. I mean, what are you guys doing now? Yeah. So now um, we haven't shifted much. I am. So I've got about 60 rental doors. I'd say about, you know, half of those in I solely own and the other half in my partnership. And uh, I do say probably do six to 10 flips a year. And when I say flips, I just mean I flip the deal. That I don't necessarily like rehab the property. So sometimes we buy them, at, we buy them and then put them back on the market and sell them 
as I said, sometimes we do a full rehab and sell it for top market value. It just depends on my cash situation at the time or what projects I got going on or, you know, if I can find another contractor to work on it, right? It just, so many factors depend on what we do with the property. But that's what we're doing. And so I've always had my business built around finding great deals, right? My business has never been just built around only finding rentals or only finding flips or, you know, only finding multifamilies. For me, it's deals, 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 right? Find great deals. If you find great deals, you can monetize them, right? There's numbers of ways to monetize them. The better the deal, the more exit strategies. And so um, that's just kind of how... I've set everything up. And so all, my focus right now has just been to expand my marketing. And by expand, I mean like new strategies for finding off-market deals. And so I'm doing some, I started using Deal Machine to do some, uh, uh, have people doing some driving for dollars for me so that I don't have to get out there and do it and uh, find new leads, right? Which is a little different because you're finding distressed properties. You don't necessarily know other than the distress on the outside, if they have any motivation or equity. It's a new tactic, but it's working for a lot of people. And uh, because I already have a background in direct mail and know how how it works, um, it's been pretty good so far. I just started a few weeks ago. So we're expanding there. And then I'm going to expand, haven't yet, and do some um, text message campaigns, just trying to reach people a different way. Because I agree with you that the direct mail has slowed down in the past six to 12 months for me. And that could be the pandemic. And it it just could be that direct mail is slowing down. You don't really know for sure. But what it has shown me is that I need to expand my approach. Yeah, super cool. So finding new avenues for that. So 60 doors, how long have you been doing this business? Just over three years now. Just over three years. That's amazing, man. So, I mean, what do you tell to someone? Because I'm sure that people come to you and ask for advice and they've seen what you've done in your local market and they tell you, well, Henry, I would do this business, but I don't have but a thousand dollars in savings. Perfect. It's just the right amount. <laughs> <laughs> so if there's a will, there's a way is what you're saying. Yeah, absolutely. That's what, that's what I tell people. It's, um, you know, I, I talk to people all the time and it's always like, I'm going to invest as soon as, you know, I pay off my house as soon as I pay off my debt, as soon as, you know, you know, we have our first kid. Right. And, and, you know, what I tell people is the harsh reality of that is like, that's just an excuse for you not to start. Right. It may be rooted in what you feel like is truth and good logic. But like, if you really do some soul searching, it's just a way for you to put it off because We make time and effort for the things that are important to us as human beings. That's what we do. Like, I didn't start investing until it was hugely important to me based on, you know, my lifestyle changes, right? And so what what I tell people is whenever you get to that point, when you're ready, you'll start regardless of your situation, right? It's here that has to change and then you'll start. It's not your, it's not your surrounding situation that needs to change. Man, that is so true. I hear it all the time. Like whenever I have some money, I'll invest. Or when I have more time, I'll invest. And the thing is, man, and you know this, it's like the business creates the money and it creates the time. It's like, you got to start the business. If you don't have time or money, that means you have to do the business today. It's not going to ever get better. Like, oh, I'll start 10 years from now. Like you're going to lose so much by just waiting on the correct situation, the stars to align. Because I mean, as you know, that never happens. Most people, man, would be like, oh, well, I wish I would have done this when I was single. Right. But for you, it took, hey, you know, like I may have children on the way and I've got to provide something. I've got to create something so that, that they're taken care of and that they have the life that they want. And it, it's just, it's unbelievable to me, the excuses that people make for themselves. And at the end of the day, it's fear. It's fear. It's fear. And that's, it, it, you know, it's something I learned early on, you know, but I, I tell people that, like, you know, you don't have to wait to pay off that debt to start investing. You can start investing and your investment can pay off that debt. Like, that's the difference between an investor's mindset or an entrepreneur's mindset and a, and a regular person's mindset, you know, and um, fear. I realized that in the very beginning, because b- before I got started with my first campaign, marketing direct mail campaign, 
I didn't have any money, right? And so direct mail marketing costs money. And if you're not going to allocate the proper amount of money to your direct mail campaign, you might as well not do it, right? You can't. Yes. That's right. You need to spend a thousand bucks. You can't spend 500 and hope you get a deal, right? You need to spend the right amount of money to get a deal. And so once I put all the numbers together and saw what it was going to cost me to send my first campaign, you know, I crawled at it, Brad, and I was like, I don't know. It was going to cost me um, $1,500, right? It was basically a few hundred dollars for the list and about another 11, 1200 bucks to send the first, the first campaign and um, uh, mailing. And uh, I was like, when you only have a thousand bucks, right? $1,500 is a whole lot of money. It hurts, right? man. It hurts. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so, yeah, man, I got scared. And, um, and so what I did was I just, I literally wrote down like, well, what are you scared of? Right. And I said, I'm scared of spending $1,500. Right and not getting a return on my investment, right? Okay, so what does that mean? That means you're scared of failing. You're scared of this, this campaign not producing results and or you not being able to close the deal if the campaign does produce results, right? So those are the things I was scared of. And I said, well, let's break that down even further. You know, do you think you can do this? Well, yeah, I think I can do it. All right, so you think you can close the deal? Scratch that one off, that's not really a fear, right? Are you scared of losing money? Yeah, I'm absolutely scared of losing money. Okay, how can you alleviate that fear, right? And so I thought, and I was like, okay, well, what if I took a credit card that was interest only or no interest for 15 months, right? Could you afford $1,500 divided by 15 months? Yeah, I can afford that, right? I can afford that extra payment with the job that I have, right? I looked at my finances, I said, if I fall on my face, I'm making this $100, $150 payment for the next 15 months, I can afford that. It'll be fine. And so then that fear was gone. Like I knew I could afford to fail, right, and be okay. And so now I have no more fears. So There's no excuses. It was just action. And so once I figured that out, took out the credit card, put the money on it, sent the campaign, and off I went. See, I had a slightly different strategy for this because I had the same thing. So I had my first note cash out. And as this was the first time, that I really had like a good chunk of excess cash to work with. And I was like, okay, like let's sit down, let's figure out how we're going to allocate this and scale up. You know, like I, I had a good bit of note equity and cash flow, but I never had like a bunch of cash. Right. And so I was like, okay, like I'm going to spend $15,000 on mail. I'd never done mail before. And instead of doing like the healthy thing and like writing down the fears and like really analyzing it, what I decided to do is have like five my ties. You know, so like I had my five Mai Tais, I was actually in Maui and I was like, I had really bad. It was actually one of the best parts of my life. Honestly, I had a uh, really bad jet lag. I'd get up at like 2 a.m. their time. There's a 24 hour Starbucks that was maybe 30 yards from the ocean. So like I would get up, have my coffee. I'm sitting there and I'm thinking of like analyzing how am I going to do this? How am I going to do this? And, you know, I had the order already set up and this $15,000 worth of mail was allocated across, I think, four months. And so I was like, okay you know, midday, I'm having my Mai Tais. I'm like, I'm going to do it today. I'm going to do it today. I'm going to process it today. So I've never spent $15,000 on anything. I've never bought a car for 15 grand. Like I'm going to spend, take the biggest purchase of my life thus far and put it into marketing. So I ended up processing it. And afterwards I felt a little nervous, but I'm like, well, it's done now. (laughs) (laughs) But I a hundred percent agree. But I mean, at the end of the day, marketing is, is good marketing is the best investment that you can make with cash. Yeah, you know, like, I don't like buying houses with cash and tying up cash in houses and those kinds right. of things. But you know, there's always room to do more good marketing if you need the deals. So that makes a lot of sense. To talk about fear real quick, I think that I'm overall a pretty afraid person, mm-hmm. but it means the exact opposite for me in many ways. So like a lot of people feel like, well, I'm afraid to fail, so I'm not going to try. For me, like if you have an idea of success in your mind, and you haven't yet met that idea of what success is, you're already failing. Right. So for me, it's like, I'm afraid to fail means I'm afraid to not get there. So it's like, let me do whatever I can to get to that destination. You know what I mean? The yeah. problem that I've found in my life is that that destination is always about three miles away from where I'm running to. You know what yeah. I mean? So it's like, it's like the marathon and you're at like mile 24 and you think you're getting close to the end and the goalpost just kind of keeps moving. You know what I mean? So that's one thing for the people that have seen some success. I would really caution you on that. Like be sure and celebrate your wins along the way. Absolutely. That's something that I never really did. 
so, so true. You know, to, to me, the, to me, what I figured out was the bigger risk was not taking action, right? The yeah. bigger risk for me was if I do nothing, like I can't give my family the life they deserve. That is a way larger risk, in my opinion, than taking some action and trying to get us to where I feel like we should be. Man, that's deep. That's deep. So let's switch gears and talk about the perception of this business. And I've talked about this on a different podcast episode, but for those of you who didn't catch it, I had an an uncle at a a cookout tell some family members that, oh, well, you know, Brad, what he does for a living is he steals people's houses. You know what I mean? And ironically, when the guy lost his job, he actually came to me and said, hey, you know, I hear you're doing pretty well at investing. I'd like to get to the game. I was like, this is a little bit ironic. You know what I mean? Like, uh, I didn't say anything because I, I, I'm not that guy. It's like, wait a minute, didn't you say this? You know, that's what I wanted to say, but I didn't because yeah, I'm cordial. But uh, he ended up not getting into the business based on the fear that we just talked about. Right. Uh, but anyway, I think that there's a perception of those outside the business that maybe they don't understand the value that we bring. Is there a certain transaction that you've had where you thought, man, like we really, really helped that person? Yeah, man. Uh, several, several. So, you know, we approach you know, every situation from the perspective of how can we help this person, right? And I say that because in order for you to buy a home at a discount, you're really buying a situation more than you're buying a home, right? Somebody has to be in a difficult spot that they don't see or have a way out of, right? In order for you to to truly get a home at a discount, because if they didn't have a situation holding them back, they just call a realtor, right? They just go get retail value for at home, right? You know, we tell everybody when we come into contact with them, especially if it looks like their home is fine, that you can get more money going with a realtor, right? I'll even tell you how much more I think you can get. Yeah. Because I don't want anybody selling to me and feeling misguided, right? I don't have an obligation to tell them that, but I do feel like I have a moral obligation. Yes. I let everybody know, like, hey, there's nothing wrong with this house. If you call a realtor, here's what I think you can get for it. My offer will be nowhere near that. And if after they have that information, they decide they still want my offer and they decide they still want to sell from me, it's either one of two things. There's something that they're not telling me that's keeping them from going the realtor route that they may be just too embarrassed to tell me, or they just truly don't want to deal or work with a realtor. I've had both situations happen. And I even give them my realtor. I say, here, here is a great realtor who will come sell this for you and sell it for you quickly. Right. And some people want it and some people don't. But to backtrack, because these people are in situations, right, they're calling us because they need help out of that situation. And so I want to make sure that even if we don't buy the house, we figure out a way like to be of value to someone. Right. We have I've walked into houses and just through the exchange of talking to the seller can tell by their body language and the tone of their voice that they really don't want to sell their house. Right. They feel like they don't have another choice. And so I've been in situations where this guy was going through a divorce. He felt like he needed to sell his house. and He didn't quite know what to do. And so as I started probing a little more, you know, he really just needed to talk to a lawyer and didn't think he could afford it. So I set him up with my lawyer and I paid for it his uh, conversation, at least initial conversation with a lawyer to help him figure out what he could do, right? Never bought that house, never saw the guy again, but I know that I helped him, right? And that's important to me. I walked into a house that was uh, definitely in some distress, but it was loved. People were living there and they enjoyed it. And, uh, And they were selling because they were behind on payments and didn't want to lose it. They were looking to sell, but unfortunately they owed more than I could offer. Um, so we couldn't make a deal. And so I easily could have just left. I easily could have just said, I'm so sorry. I can't help you out of this situation because I can't buy it for enough that would allow you to, to sell it to me. You would have to pay me money to sell it. And I said, that's not a situation you can be in. But instead of just leaving, like I had them find their mortgage paperwork and their utilities paperwork And I paid their mortgage for the next month and I paid the utilities for the next month to buy them another 30 days of trying to figure out what they can do. Maybe they still lost the house. Maybe they didn't. I don't know. But I know I helped them. I know I bought them some more time. Right. There was another situation where a lady needed to move. She was 
I mean, she had just accumulated so much stuff over the years and it was mostly her kids stuff. It was like her house was really kids storage unit, right? <laughs> for their stuff. And she was getting to a place where she needed to sell. And again, I couldn't offer her enough to make sense for her, but she was a elderly woman and her kids and I help her. And so I told her, I said, look, I can't buy it, but when you find somebody to buy it, call me and I'll pay for movers to come move you. That way you don't have to figure out how to move your own stuff, right? And when she found somebody to buy it, she called me and we moved her. So I just feel like there's ways to be of value to your community that doesn't require you to buy their house, but does require you to be, you know, a good human being, right? So just build your community through love, right? Amen to that, man. And that's so great. And the, the fact is that there are so many people that are so fearful that there's not another deal out there in their market. And so they get to one place and they think, well, I've got to buy this house. And they can't operate from a position of abundance to where they can help people one way or the other. You know, we've bought a lot of, of houses where we do the same thing. I mean, the house is immaculate. They don't need us. And it's like, look, you, you'd make a lot more money with a realtor. And I've literally had some people tell us like, no, Brad, you're buying this house. Right. We haven't talked about price or terms yet, but they're committed that we're the ones buying it. And yep. especially whenever they know like, hey, we're going to be honest and tell the truth on the front end, like it makes the negotiation a lot easier on the back end anyway. Absolutely. But it's really short-sighted to, for people to just like, you know, every, it's like all they have is a hammer and every problem has to be a nail. It's like, we're buying this house, we're buying this house, we're buying this right. house. It's like, maybe that's not the best strategy yep. long-term. Yeah. And, it, and, you know, it's in some situations, like I said, I've never heard from those people again. And in some situations, I get calls from a neighbor or somebody that said, hey, I talked to, you know, so and so. And she said, you took care of her. I have a house that I need to sell. Right. And so, you know, word of mouth goes a long way. Just being a good person, being a good, you know, honest person goes a long way as well. And, you know, it also it makes me feel good, helps me sleep at night knowing that, like, I try to help everybody I come into contact with. That's what's important to me. And if you, if I focus on that, you know, the, the deals will come. And that's a great, great legacy to have. Henry, appreciate you being with us. For those that are interested in learning more about you and what you're doing and, and how you can help them get into this business, how can they contact you? Uh, best way to contact me is my Instagram. You can reach me at uh, Independence Realty Group on Instagram. And um, you can send me a direct message through there. Try to try to answer everybody. Very good. We'll put that in the show notes. Again, Henry, really enjoyed it. Thanks for being with us. Thank you very much.